the Winnipeg Jets came to town. Now, they were the show ponies, man. And they had, uh, they had the best team and arguably the best team in the WHA. And they had the marquee player, the great Bobby Hall. And here was Bobby Hall. This was 1972. And I used to watch as a kid. I sat on my couch with my, my family couch with my father. We watched Chicago Blackhawks win the Stanley Cup in 6061. And Bobby was the Golden Jet. And I mean, here I am now, uh, 11 years later, and I am actually facing off against Bobby Hall. In other words, he was playing left wing, and I'm playing right wing. And there's Bobby. And I, and I saw my opportunity. And I said, as we waited at the face-off square for Wayne Carlton and whoever he was, his center, to square up and take the draw, I said to Bobby, um, are you out here to shadow me? <laughs> <laughs> you know what he said to me? Fuck off. <laughs> I don't know if you can say that or you can edit that, but he, that's what he said to me. So, so I said to myself, well, I guess Bobby doesn't have much of a sense of humor. <laughs> I mean, you know, all these players had, had shattered him from Claude Prolo and all these famous guys. I, I thought I'd sort of switch it around, you know, <laughs> and make him giggle, and he didn't. Welcome to the Pro Hockey Alumni Podcast, the voice of hockey legends. This is the classic hockey show for classic hockey fans. We celebrate the history of the game with stories told by the select few who actually lived it. Get ready for an all-access pass to the heart of the hockey universe. Our guest on episode 43 of the Pro Hockey Alumni Podcast is Mike Boland, an original member of the WHA Ottawa Nationals, a Calder Cup winner with the Springfield Kings in the AHL, briefly a Broad Street bully in Philadelphia, and ultimately one of Canada's premier cinematographers. Mike is humorous and personable, and he's got captivating stories about hockey legends like Bobby Hull, by the way, there's part two to the story you just heard, Billy Smith, Butch Goring, Battleship Bob Kelly, Dave Killer Hansen, Gilles Looney Gratton, Johnny Wilson, and many more. Now Mike doesn't hold back as he relives his journey through the big leagues, the minor leagues, and European hockey. All of our guests have been great, and Mike is certainly no exception. Now we'll see Mike this weekend at the annual Hockey Day in Springfield on July 27, 2019. Tickets are not available at the door, so you want to call or go online. We'll give you that information in a moment. Currently, there are 28 former players and VIPs. Bruce Landon, an upcoming guest on our show with his new book, A Great Lunch, included in your ticket price. Free stuff, amazing auction prizes, mascots, the T-Birds team bus, Springfield hockey merchandise, and a whole lot more. All in the air-conditioned Young Building at Big E. Get your tickets while you can at hockeyday2019.eventbrite.com. You can see that link in the show notes. Or stop by Steve Sports at 94 Front Street in West Springfield. Got to do that today, though. Now, let's talk classic hockey with Mike Boland. Well, he won a Calder Cup in 1971 with the Springfield Kings. He was an original Ottawa National in the World Hockey Association. Was with the Broad Street Bullies in the mid-70s. And... That was the Philadelphia Flyers, of course, and eventually traded in his hockey stick for a camera and became a, a widely respected and award-winning cinematographer. We have Mike Boland here today. Thanks so much for being with us. And Mark, thank you for inviting me and looking forward to talking to you and through you, of course, all your fans. Right. We have a lot of fans in there, hardcore hockey fans and 
I wanted to pick your career up uh, at, in, at the college level with the University of Toronto. You had an opportunity to go to various colleges in the United States. You chose to be uh, a part of the University of Toronto program, the Varsity Blues. Uh, what was your decision-making process there, Mike? Yeah, I got hijacked <laughs> by a man by the name of Tom Watt. Oh, okay. And Tom Tom went on to become a uh, coach with Winnipeg Jets and from Maple Leafs. But he was the coach in Toronto back in the 60s. And Uja Toronto was the finest college hockey team, university hockey team. I'm biased to say North America. I think we had a phenomenal club. And first of all, it all went back to me moving down from Ottawa to Toronto. And I got invited over to Nugent to play for Ottawa Generals. And that was Bobby Orr's last year. And... Ren Blair offered me a AB contract. We have to sign a C form. My dad, who was a colonel in the Air Force, said, "Nah, you don't want to do that." And we went to I went to St. Mike's, and so I turned down the Ontario Generals. The next year, they invited me back and said, "Why don't you play for the Ontario Generals? We'll give you a contract right now." I said, "No, I'm going to stay at St. Mike's." So I. I was a stubborn uh, student. I was an athlete, student athlete. And then I, in grade 13, we had grade 13 here. I had about nine scholarships offered to me to go to uh, Cornell. Uh, one was for Harvard because I was a was an Ontario scholar, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. And as until I started playing hockey with a helmet, without mm-hmm. a helmet. And, um, but, but I, I turned him down because Tom convinced me to go to the Institute Toronto. That's how I ended up at the Institute Toronto. Man, I just stubbornly went with my own whimsical little decisions, as we all tend to do from time to time. Absolutely. And as you said, Tom Watt, a uh, renowned coach, was ahead of his time when he came into the National Hockey League. And, of course, the Varsity Blue is a strong program, to say the least. And yeah. eventually, you have an opportunity to you get an invite from the Los Angeles Kings of the National Hockey League, which you eventually reject because uh, it was an offer maybe that wasn't sufficient for you, if I'm if I'm re- recollecting this pr- properly, tell, you, you, tell us a little bit know, about that. You know a lot, Mark. Mm-hmm. You know more about me than me. <laughs> <clears throat> I'll tell you what happened. So after my second year of university, it was a three-year program because we had grade 13 as opposed to the United States programs where you go to grade 12 and then you have a four-year college program. And so... So I went to the Toronto. We won the college championship both years. And then at the end of my second last year, my second year, um, I got an invite to Los Angeles Kings training camp. And I went out there, and that was the year that Alan McDonough was the first draft pick. And he was good, man. He, but I, I noticed every bit as... as that training camp is that one, yeah. mm-hmm. And back in those days, they made no bones about what they were offering. So they were offering Alan 4500 to sign and 95 to play. And they offered me 3000 to sign and 8000 to play in Springfield. And a two-way contract. He got a minor league, a major league NHL contract. And so I, I went in. So Larry Reason, who was a general manager of Los Angeles Kings, said, uh, so Mike, um, uh, Johnny Wilson really likes you, and um, we're willing to sign you for uh, three and eight. And I said, well, I understand Alan's getting uh, 45 and nine. He said, yeah, but he's our first draft pick. And I said, yeah, but <laughs> Larry, I had a better training camp than him. Mm-hmm. Talking as hell. 
you know, he's a student, right? And he goes, well, you know, son, you were pretty good in training camp, no question. But, I, but I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to stick that out offer, take it or leave it. And I said, well, I'm going to leave it. How's that sound? He said, sure, you try to see you later, bye. So I went out the door, went back to Toronto, and I went, gosh, I wonder if he's going to call. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't call me. He didn't call me. I made the wrong decision. So now I'm, I get to Toronto bored as hell and broke, by the way. And I just come up with enough money for my tuition. And I was born playing college hockey for one both years. And so I, I didn't quit the university, but I quit the team. And I phoned Johnny up, Johnny Wilson, in, in, in Springfield. And I said, can, 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 can I rethink my decision? Right. <laughs> he said, well, let me, let me talk to Larry. I'll call you back. So here I am in limbo, going to my classes, not playing for the University of Toronto, but I have to do it. Tom Watt looking at me like I just murdered seven people. <laughs> and, and so, so he, so Larry calls me back, and so Johnny calls me back, so, come on down to Springfield. Have you got a car? I said, yeah. Drive down. We'll pay your expenses. You come in a five game trial. And, uh, and we'll put you up and you can see how you go. And I said, geez, Johnny, thanks, man. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you're the best. So I went down there, and Springfield was the worst team in American hockey league. And there was only eight teams. You know, like, there was Providence, Montreal Boys, Springfield, Quebec, Aces. And on the other side of the equation, there was Baltimore Clippers, uh, Hershey Bears, uh, Cleveland, um, Cleveland, um, Dines, thank you, Brain Damage, Cleveland Dines, and Rochester Americans. And they were the good side, we were the poor side. And, and Johnny stuck me right on the line with my hero, uh, Gary Deneen. And you gotta understand, I went to St. Mike's, and Gary Deneen was, a St. Mike's legend under Father Bauer, and he went on to become a uh, national when Father Bauer formed the Canadian national team, uh, and we and we played in the '64 and '68 Olympics as a Father Bauer guided team. Mm -hmm. Gary was one of the stars. Now Gary's in Springfield, signed with Minnesota, and didn't work out. Came down to. And, and I'd met him at training camp, you know, and I was um, effusive, shall we say, in my praise for, for Gary is not only a great hockey player, a great student athlete, um, a, 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 a national team hero, and a say nice guy. And I went, to this. So he put me right on the line with Gary. And Gary was a left-handed center. And I tell you what, for the five games, it was great. I scored a couple of goals. And um, do, do, do you want me to keep going? Because there was a rather big moment in the second game. We went to Providence and played Providence Reds. And they had a guy on the team by the name of Battleship Bob Kelly. That's what I was going to ask you about. Yeah. The, uh, the, first of all, just... Know about just for our fans, those, uh, and our fans all know, but I, just as a reminder, Battleship Bob Kelly, of course, went on to play in the National Hockey League with the Penguins and Blackhawks and earned a reputation as one of the most ferocious fighters and hardest punchers in the game. And if you go on YouTube, you watch a fight with Battleship Bob Kelly and John Wensink, and it is just uh, bombs away. It's incredible. But anyway, um, our friend Mike yeah. is now going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe -to -toe with Battleship. He destroyed Wednesday. Anyway, so so it's 2-2 two -two in the middle of the second period. And Gary sets me up in front of the net. Now, every time, let me preface this by saying that before the game started, all the veterans on the team, you know, Price and Roger Cote and some of these guys, saying, don't go near that man. 
<laughs> See that guy, Bob Kelly? Don't even go near him. Don't talk to him. Don't look him in the eye. I'd do yourself a favor. You're a young college kid. <laughs> I was 20. And so I get on the ice. Gary sets me up, puts the puck on my stick. I shoot it goes in the net. We're up 3 2. And uh, I'm pretty proud of myself. Thank you, Gary. We go to the next shift, and I'm in front of the net. And Battleship Bob Kelly comes by and spears me in the stomach. And I come from Irish heritage. <laughs> And I went, who the hell do you think you are? And he said, you want to drop them? And I said, let's go. And I dropped the gloves and swung and missed. And he hit me and sent me to the planet Mars. <laughs> he broke and dislocated my nose. I was on the ice. I saw stars. And then graciously picked me up, turned me around and said, penny box over there and he pushed me and I just kind of glided <laughs> into the box <laughs> like I didn't know whether as they say in Australia my name was Arthur or Martha and then um, so I just sat there and then of course in the second period I'm in there the trainer Peter Demers he said oh, just put this ice on your face and then the story for Peter Johnny said you don't have to play if you don't want to and I said, no, no, I'm okay. <laughs> I, I'm i fine. So I went out there and played 3 We won 4-2, and, and um, as we're coming out of the bus, one of the routines was Peter Demers, the trainer, would give you a beer and a sandwich for the short trip back from Providence to Springfield. And Johnny sat in the front seat said, did you get any good ones in? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I really killed him. <laughs> wow. Well, what a way welcome to... Uh, to pro hockey. Yeah, welcome to pro hockey. Yeah, then, you started at, at the top. And then after five games, uh, they signed me to the contract, and, and I played the rest of the season with, with Springfield. Well, you mentioned, <laughs> you, you mentioned Mike, that... For, for example, this past hockey season, St. Louis Blues went from worst to winning the Stanley Cup. Yeah. And in 71, it's not unprecedented because in 71, as you noted, in the American League, the Kings were wallowing and, of course, end up winning the entire Calder Cup championship. What is your assessment of that? I mean, you, you obviously had some key players who go on to great success in the NHL, Butch Goring and Bill Smith. But what was about that? Uh, what was what was the? He had a good coach, Johnny Wilson. So what was uh, what was happening uh, in Springfield that got things turned around so dramatically? I'll tell you exactly what happened. And I'm liaison with uh, Tracy Wilson, the wonderful daughter of Johnny Wilson, mm -hmm. who's writing a book on her father. Oh wow! And you will see her this weekend at the Springfield. I can hear that she's coming up from North Carolina. Oh, great. But, yeah, no, it's true. She's, she's and a professional journalist and a wonderful writer and a wonderful person. Tracy's just the great, greatest. And I'm helping her with to remember those things that are not written by the, to the scribes, uh, the journalists at the Springfield paper and whatever. I'm trying to give her an insight into, there's a lot of guys, unfortunately, uh, have passed away, like Gary Deneen, Ed Huckstra, uh, Billy Early, uh, Larry McNabb, Mike McMahon, Doug Vellman. All these guys are great greats, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But they, what happened was this. We, we cruised into negative land in the early part of February. We lost. We went to Cleveland arguably the best team in the American Hockey League, staffed with the like of Joey Johnson, Walt McKechnie, uh, and a sundry others. They were, really, they were a really good team. Mm -hmm. And we lost 12-1. Then we got on the bus and went to Baltimore for Saturday, and we lost 14-0. Now, the Baltimore Clippers 
we're stuck with a whole bunch of older guys, Jim Morrison, Bobby Rivard, um, guys are in there, Kent Douglas, believe it or not, guys on their late 39, 40, 40 years old. And every time Baltimore would score a goal, what they do is, is they play this music. Go you Baltimore Clippers. Go you Clippers from Baltimore. You hear that 14 times. <laughs> you tend to like, get a, a, a slightly graded. <laughs> you could see Johnny. He went, he turned to Peter Bermuda and said, here, you coach the team at the end, the end of the second period. I've had enough of this. And Peter managed the lines. We got killed. And so when we got back on Sunday morning, uh, to Springfield, Johnny said, didn't say a word until we arrived back. And then he got up, and I'll pray you're ready to get off the bus. And he said, tomorrow Sunday, or today, Sunday, early in the morning, drove up from Baltimore to Springfield. He said, um, have a good holiday tomorrow, or today, Sunday. Go with your friends, go with your teammates, have some beers, have some laughs, have some jokes. Mm-hmm. Because on Monday, we'll see you at 9 o'clock. And it appears that you gentlemen are not in very good shape. And so I'm going to put you in shape. So you may want to bring a sandwich because you're going to be, you could be on the ice for a while. <laughs> so we showed up on Monday morning, 9 o'clock, put a staff on, everybody's. <laughs> Scared. What are you going to do? For the first hour and 20 minutes, no uh, pucks. We oh, just yeah. skated. And then we got off the ice, they resurfaced the ice, then we played scrimmage. And he said, full contact scrimmage. We played till 12 noon. And then he came in the dressing room at the end of that, and he said, see you tomorrow. Have a good rest. We did that Tuesday. We did that Wednesday. Uh, we had a light practice Thursday, and we left to play Hershey for Friday. And we played Hershey, tied them 6-6. Six, six. At least we didn't lose. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny beat us up. Then he made a number of trades. He traded probably. Butch Goring got sent back from Los Angeles Kings to Springfield. Um. Bill Orban and Wayne Schultz were traded from Cleveland to Springfield for Roger Cote and uh, Terry Holbrook. And although Terry Holbrook was a uh, owned by Los Angeles Kings, Roger's contract was owned by Springfield. Johnny could do whatever he wanted. So we, you know, we, we got, uh, we, we, you know, we, with the addition of Wayne Scholes, who played with Gary and I, and the addition of Bill Orman, who played with when Butchie came down and played with uh, with uh, Doug Vollmer, and then Mike McMahon's contract was picked up from Minnesota, and then he traded for Larry McNabb, or he just picked him up, I think. Anyways, we had a pretty strong team. <laughs> all of a all of a sudden, mm-hmm. so. Between the trades, the, the strategic moves that Iron Man Johnny Wilson made, and the um, and picking up uh, some extra players and and beating us with a big whip <laughs> to teach you, to, to teach us a lesson not to lose. I would say those are the two most dramatic things that happened. And that's showing the the prowess of Johnny Wilson, who had an excellent career at, at a number of different levels. Of course, first of all, as a player, and then as oh, as, yeah. as, a, as a coach, somewhat un, unheralded. Marvelous man, marvelous man, marvelous man. What type of speaking of that team? All the goaltending in the uh, playoffs that year was handled by Billy Smith. Did you have any yeah. for, you have any foretelling that he would become the Hall of Fame goaltender he ended up being? Uh, what type of guy was he back then? No, I, you know, some he was picked down the road by uh, Los Angeles Kings. He wasn't a first draft pick; he was like third or fourth. 
He, I, as a matter of fact, he wasn't even playing Major Junior. I think he was playing for Smith Falls in two two. He was a he was a um, a ferocious kind of a guy, but he's an Ottawa Valley guy. Earned prior cut Smith Falls, and um, and Billy Billy uh, was special in a way. He, you know, he, he was only he's only twenty. Uh, he lived near us, so Gary and I, I just ended up living with Gary Denise and Doug Vaughn out by the lake in Congamon Lakes in Connecticut. And and he was not far from me, he was just a couple of doors down. And he, he was, and Doug Vaughn had the hardest shot in the world. And and Doug would shoot at his head. And he'd run out of the net mm-hmm. and say to Johnny, stop shooting, he's got to stop shooting at me. He's gonna kill me. I don't wanna I don't wanna do this. And he just kinda of moved out of the way. And, but he was and you could see he had some talent until he hit the playoffs. And then all of a sudden he was lights out. Now, a good friend of mine, uh now, not then, but now, was probably the best player in the American hockey league, arguably. And it was between Joey Johnson with Cleveland Bands, who went on to play with, with um, Oakland Seals, uh, and, and Butch Goring. They were the two best players, I thought. And now Joey could, he could do anything. But as Joey and I, because I lived in Springfield, or sorry, I lived in Peterborough, Ontario for a while, which is where Joey lives. We used to go for coffee at, uh, at Tim Hortons. And he said, you know, son, I could not score on Billy Smith. I just couldn't. Like, between Bill Orban scoring at will on our goalie and me, and the onus was on me to score on Billy, and I don't think I had one goal. And we were a better team than you. And you beat us. Right. And he was right. Right. That's right. Mike, what's the, f- the feeling like? So everything comes together. It seems like there's a, a lot of chemistry there and camaraderie. You've been kind of to the bottom of the barrel with Springfield, as you said. Johnny Wilson kind of whips you back into shape, makes some transactions. You go to the finals and win, I believe, over Providence that year. No, not Providence. Who, who did you beat in the finals? Four straight. We, we beat Montreal. Warriors, a year before they moved to Halifax, it became a powerhouse. Uh, we beat Montreal in three straights, best of five. We beat Cleveland in five, best of seven. We beat them in five. We beat Providence four straight. We lost one game. It took us, it took us 12 games to win the Calder Cup. And the funny thing is that the coach of the Providence Reds was Johnny Wilson's brother, Larry. So it was brother to brother. <laughs> and that was so interesting because we just beat them for a What was the feeling like of coming together? You don't get a chance to win championships often, obviously, statistically, and they're hard to do. So you've come from the bottom, you get to the top, you win the whole thing. What was that feeling like of winning the Calder Cup? Well, you know, I had won college championship the previous two years. So I'm getting used to winning championships. Now, I'm just 20, then turned 21, but we won the the EHL. And the game is to win the championship. I don't care whether it's Stanley Cup, Calder Cup, Memorial Cup, uh, NCAA, uh, Canadian College Championship. It's the game is to win. I mean, if you're just out there for the sport of hockey, just don't play old time hockey because that that's a lot of fun. And you just go out there for a skate and you're trying to have some fun with your friends. Pro hockey isn't that way. Mm-hmm. It's a business that you have to win. And if you don't win, there's going to be questions asked. And trying to address that issue, now Johnny Wilson played the whole of the 1950s 
That's Iron Man Johnny Wilson with the Detroit Red Wings. And he won three Stanley Cups with the Detroit Red Wings. He looked at how he was doing. He, he played for Jack Adams, and then he played for, uh, for um, the former Saint and uh, the great Hall of Famer, Ted Lindsay, Gordy Allen, and um, oh, what was his name? He ended up coaching the team. Former center and Hall of Fame. Oh, uh, Sid Abel. Sid Abel, thank you. Yeah, no more calls. we got a winner right here. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> yes, he, Sid Abel. And, 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 and so he came from that system. And he, he, he branded us with that system. But the other thing that Johnny knew for, from my perspective and for Wayne um, Rashad's and a couple of the college, college guys were not, we were less than 5% of the population in pro hockey. Everybody basically came out of junior hockey. That's really the way it was back in those days. But, but I, I, I was a college guy, and a few other guys in the league were college guys, not many. Johnny, for those who don't know the career of Johnny Wilson, he also coached Princeton. So he knew his way around college players. So he wasn't, although he grew up in the harsh 50s where uh, the coaches ruled with a, with a rod and a whip, he didn't think like that. Johnny didn't think like that. Johnny felt like, Johnny felt like a human being. And that's, that to me, he was a, he was vital in, in what we did and how we did what we did. I can't say enough about Johnny and his brother Larry because I ended up playing for Larry as well. Yes, he did. And, and, and the, Wilson, the Wilson family, I, I don't think I'd have a pro hockey career, but wasn't it the Wilson family? All right, well, that's, that's fabulous. It certainly says people. a lot. And as you noted, noted Mike, early, earlier, it is a business. And coming onto the scene in 1972 is a new major league, the World Hockey Association. And you end, yeah. up, you end up signing with the Ottawa Nationals for their maiden. And it turned out to be only voyage uh, in the league. Talk a little bit about that decision-making process. How did they approach you? And I'm assuming there was a yeah. significant, significant upgrade in pay. Well, yeah, I can tell you exactly what. Like, like I made eight thousand dollars in nineteen seventy seventy one, and I was offered a contract for nineteen thousand dollars in seventy two seventy three by the Ottawa Nationals. And the way they asked me to play for them was the general manager was Buck Hull. And keep in mind that when I played. For St. Mike's, the very famous school, St. Mike's, um, or the Bowers School. And then, usually, Toronto, Baku was the general manager of Toronto Marlboros, and he knew exactly who it was. And so, when it came time to put a team together, Baku got in touch with me and said, We're offering you a contract with the Auto Nationals with WHA. And I jumped at it. I thought it was terrific. And so, so I signed with, with the Ottawa Nationals. And I trained like hell in the summer. I really wanted to make it a breakout year. Um, just so you know, just so everybody else, just so the listeners know what kind of a hockey player I And a lot of hockey players don't describe themselves. It's very difficult to have an objective <laughs> view of your own skill. Right. Set. And what I was, was a good hockey player, good skater, in, in the corners. I was 6'1", 6 six foot, 6, six, foot, six foot, uh, 200 pounds. I wasn't, I wasn't scared. I wasn't shy. But the, the one problem, and good skater, but the one prize Johnny said, you can't shoot. I wasn't a natural sniper. Mm-hmm. If I'd been a sniper, it was a one-way ticket, but I struggled at that in those early days. So when I, I came into camp really well in shape, and I, I made the first line, 
with Ron Carney and Wayne Carlton, Big Swoop, and, and uh, Big Swoop Carlton, and read the first, the first line. And, and, and our very first game, our home game opener, the Winnipeg Jets came to town. Now, they were the show ponies, man. And they had, uh, they had the best team and arguably the best team in the WHA. And they had the marquee player, the great Bobby Hall. And here was Bobby Hall. This is 1972. And I used to watch as a kid. I sat on my couch with my, my family couch with my father. We watched Chicago Blackhawks win the Stanley Cup in 60-61. And Bobby was the Golden Jet. And I mean, here I am now, uh, 11 years later, and I am actually facing off against Bobby Hall. In other words, he was playing left wing, and I'm playing right wing. And there's Bobby. And I, and I saw my opportunity. And I said, as we waited at the face-off square for Wayne Carlton and whoever he was, his center, to square up and take the draw, I said to Bobby, um, are you out here to shadow me? <laughs> <laughs> you know what he said to me? Fuck off. <laughs> I don't know if you can say that or you can edit that, but he, that's what he said to me. So so I said to myself, well, I guess Bobby doesn't have much of a sense of humor. <laughs> I mean, you know, all these players had, had shattered him from Claude Prolo and all these famous guys. I, I thought I'd sort of switch it around, you know, <laughs> and make him giggle, and he didn't. Now, here's the end of the story. And, and, and now we're looking at the late 1990s, 98, 97, 98. And I was a director of photography on a series called um, The Legends of Hockey. And oh, that really? was not only on in Canada, on TSN that was on ESPN. Awesome, by the and way. Bobby had a, yeah, about well, 10, one hours. You, you had to be in the Hockey Hall of Fame to be in the hours. And I was the DOP lighting this and shooting all those interviews. Well, it's funny you say that because I you know I've watched so many of those and I often commented to myself, yeah. they look so they look so good, they're lit so well, they're shot in, in such a yeah. way that they're, they're so consistent across the board. And we tried for tried that. Awesome, tremendous. But That's that, great. But that, but let's. I, that also, I must uh, commend the director, um, De uh, Derek Love, who was a former still photographer, and we worked that out together. So I, we shared that. As quite frank, I'm not going to claim 100. percent No, just gave me that. A, but yeah, nonetheless. But when I, can I just say one thing about that though? That series yeah, yeah, never fails yeah. when you watch it to give you the goosebumps yeah. and bring the emotions out it's, yeah. it's it, nothing i don't very very little has ever captured the emotion of of the, of the yeah. game like those so anyway great work i'll let you go back to your <laughs> story yeah. whatever. well derek let me ask a bunch of questions to each player too by the way mm -hmm. because of being an ex hockey player but nonetheless so so we did bobby we did bobby a number of times <clears throat> but the first time uh, we did it before Bobby was coming to where we had set it up at St. Mike's, by the way, we took over upstairs at St. Mike's. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a PA and I said, go to the beer store, get some, some Algonquin beer because Bobby represents them and Bobby likes the beer. And he said, well, you know, get him apple juice or Coke. I said, huh, you can't go to big, get Algonquin beer. Trust me, here's 20 bucks. Go buy the beer. So anyways, at the end of the interview, I, I walked over at the interview and I said, gee, Bobby, that was great. Here's an Algonquin beer. He goes, my God, I represent that company. And I said, I like that beer too. And so we sat down and he said, now somebody told me you were a pro hockey player. And I said, yeah, as a matter of fact, I played in the WHA. And I played against you the first year when we're at center ice in Ottawa. And I was a right winger and you were a left. And I said, hey, Bobby, you out here to shadow me. And you told me to fuck off. And he said, no way. No. <laughs> what an asshole I am. And I said, well, you know something, Bobby? I laughed at the time. And he said, well, I'm laughing now, and I'm going to apologize, and I'm going to go get us two more beers. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, my God, Bobby Hall. He and was too fantastic. He had nobody. Anyway, sorry, um, go ahead. No, the game's greatest ambassador, to, to be sure. Yeah. And oh the, the reason for the WHA to be in existence, I wanted to ask you f yeah. a, about a couple of guys who I find to be very interesting in hockey history. The Ottawa Nationals didn't have a bad team in the first year. I just said you had uh, Wayne Carlton yeah. and uh, Ron Climey, Rick Sentes. You had some guys who could score. Yeah. Um, but yeah. what, where you were, you were strong, or relatively strong, is in goal with Gilles Looney Graton and Les Binkley, the veteran. And I yes. uh, was curious if you have any uh, distinct memories of either or both of those two. <laughs> How long do you want to make this little <laughs> chit chat on your website, Mark? I tell you, I went down to, Jill Graton wrote a book with a writer by the name of Greg Oliver here. Mm -hmm. Wow, I didn't go, he didn't ghost write the book. He, he actually said, you know, Joe Gratton with Greg Oliver. And I went down to the uh, opening book signing and, and I really loved him. I only played the one year with him, but he was, what he used to do, he used to do two characters in his rather complex set of, Sound like Sybil, mm -hmm. so historically Sybil. He used to go to the piano, a great player, and he played Charles Aznavour. He knew all of Charles Aznavour's songs. Idiot de je t'aime. You know, Idiot, I love you. Very, very great love song. He'd sing this. And I used to sit around the piano with a bunch of other players. He'd take it over in the shadow front neck, shadow front neck, or wherever. He just, where we saw piano, we take it over. Wow. And it was amazing to watch him play and sing with such emotion. And the other thing he used to do was he used to watch Sesame Street and imitate the Cookie Monster. So he'd buy himself a sort of a package of cookies, then he'd eat the cookies, but he wouldn't swallow them. They'd be all over him. Like the Cookie Monster on Sesame <laughs> Street who would eat the cookies. I'll tell you what. He was, he was the most entertaining, but at the same time, most talented. But if he wants to, and you look at it more deeply, he, he wanted to be, he wanted to be liked, he wanted to be understood, and he wanted to entertain you. And that's a sensitive soul. Right. And, and when I saw him a couple of years ago with his book launch, he is a sensitive soul. He, he's a marvelous person. Bink was an old 40 year old goalie. I mean, um, and I'm not, God bless Bink, and he hung around swooping through Carlton and stuff like that. But Jill was, Jill Gutton was a treat. I loved him. I do love him. That's great. I like to hear that. I always was curious. I, I, I've never met him, and I was curious what mm. he was he was like. So that's some great insight. Yeah. Mike, it's the. Yeah. It's. Uh, I wanted to ask you about game number eight of that season. I don't know the opponent. It's a game in which you get injured with a significant shoulder injury. Oh, my God. And which kind oh, of, I don't know, so kill me. Takes, kill your, me for the year. takes your career in a whole yeah. different direction. T talk to me about that. Well, I, I fell back. It was in Quebec City. I fell back. No one hit me. But I fell back, hit the boards. My left shoulder got dislocated. And I lied on I, lay on the ice, and it was the most excruciating pain I'd ever felt. They brought, I, I wanted to get up and, and skate off the ice, and they said I couldn't, but I, I tried to. But anyways, they morphed me up in, in um, you know, in the, in the dress room. Doctor came down from a Quebec doctor, because it was in Colise de Quebec, we were playing with another dick. And uh, then they took me to a hospital. They put it back in. Me morphed up. I didn't know what planet I was on. And then they put me in a sling, and I went home with the team because they gave me enough morphine to carry me back to Ottawa. And I didn't play hard for the next two and a half months, unfortunately. And I lost my position. And uh, I never recovered from that. 
And uh, it's such a pity because it was such a freak accident. And I was going so good. Right. <laughs> and, and uh, yeah, I thought I was, was going to be okay, but I guess I wasn't. No, and it's interesting you say yeah. this because you know, we, we talk to, obviously, players all the time and so many times. I just had this conversation with Wayne Babbitt, who had a 54-goal season with St. Louis, comes out in the preseason next year, gets a shoulder injury, and the yep. it's it's not all over, but he's never the same again. He played plays the rest yep. of the year in a, in a harness. This is, is it even, even Bruce Landon, whose book I read this book this weekend, Bruce yeah. Bruce was poised to get called up by the L.A. Kings, and the same thing. It's a shoulder injury, yeah. derails that, and yep. fate, luck, chance, happenstance, and things you can't control. Uh, nonetheless, yeah. you end up in the Philadelphia well, Flyers. Billy, Billy swooped in there. That was the end of that. Mm-hmm. Billy, Billy Smith swooped in, right. took Bruce's position in the line after the Calder Cup, and then Bruce ended up jumping to the WHA and played for Hartford Whalers as a backup to Al Smith. Right, and you could probably do a, a documentary just on Al Smith, but nonetheless. Uh, for, I rode in a taxi with Al Smith. Did you really? Dr. To, to jump in, yes. Al Smith, uh, this is in the early 90s, and, and I'm with my second wife <laughs> so anyways we jumped in the taxi and sat in the back seat and I looked in the front seat and I said don't tell me you're Al Smith and he said yeah I am I said pull over and I said honey you stay in the back seat I jumped in the front seat and I said we're only going down the street but let's go for a ride we gotta go around the block a few times because we got to have a chat. How are you doing? And I had a great chat with Al Smith. He was a taxi driver. He used to, uh, he used to play hockey now with Doug Vollmer and Gary Deneen and all those Billy Orban and all those other guys up in that great league up in the sky. Right. But, uh, but he was a very interesting uh, individual, as most goalies. Gosh, I mean, I did another television series with Ken Dryden. Yes. Called Ken Ken Dryden's Home Game Series. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's a goalie. Explains a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I love to tease the goalies. I call them, I call them sound recordists. <laughs> right. Well. Because they're an odd, they're an odd group too. <laughs> it just, <laughs> but that, I only tease them. That's okay. They don't think I'm serious. And uh, <laughs> I don't. Well, I, I, I agree. They're a unique breed. Yeah. I will tell you. But in, yeah. in, jumping ahead to seventy three, seventy four. Now it is the height. It is the peak of what you would call the goon hockey. Uh, yeah. Toughness, whatever. Seventy three, seventy four. You sign with uh, the Flyers. You play in Richmond. Great. Well, so, here's the deal. I think that's, here's the, the deal. I think that's uh, I to, Johnny's brother, right? Yes, and I had to wait. I had to wait because I had a second year contract with the Ottawa Nationals they weren't going to honor. And I had one of the greatest historical lawyers in the in country of Canada, Arthur Maloney. Mm-hmm. He, was the, he was on Canada's first ombudsman. Very, very famous man. And uh, he was a great friend of Clarence Darrell and uh, was in on the, uh, you know, the two, uh, the, he, he went to Chicago with, as a young law student, a, a shining law student. He went to Chicago when those two brothers, those two guys did the uh, Nitschke killings of the, of the little boys. Oh, yeah. Okay. I forget the name. Yeah, well, Arthur Maloney was on that. He ended up becoming the greatest lawyer in the history of this country. And he was our next door neighbor. And uh, he said, listen, I'll get a lawyer and we'll get some money out of him. So so by November, I got $10,000 out of Ottawa Nationals. They became the Toronto Toros. Mm -hmm. And then I phoned Johnny. I said, Johnny, I need a job. You know, I just, 
I just got some cast and settled with John Torres. I need to play hockey again. I'm too young to quit. And he said, I'll call you back in half an hour. He called me back in half an hour and said, my brother Larry coaches um, the Richmond Robins. And he wants you to drive directly down there. He'll sign you the contract. And they were missing a couple of players. And they need a right winger. And he remembers you when you played for me and we beat, Spring, or beat Providence. So I drove down to Richmond, signed the contract with Larry, played with Larry right now in McAdam, and started to score. Finally, I started to score goals. And, and uh, it was terrific. So the next year, uh, I went to training camp. So down to, they signed me to a minor league contract, and then they put me into Philadelphia Firebirds. And I played for the Firebirds, and I played on line with Bob Collier, and he scored 33 goals and 55 assists. And it was almost like it was almost like a different player. Like I, I woke up and smelled the cappuccino. I remember what Bobby Hall used to say. Hockey's an easy game. You shoot, you score. You don't shoot, you don't score. So I started to shoot, and I scored. You sure did. Had 31, I, 31 goals in 59 games, 86 points. And I believe you were a second, yeah. second team all-star that year. But that's also, yeah. that's also Mike, the North American Hockey League at that time, that's kind of the, the spirit behind slap shot. So you're playing Johnstown. You're playing some notorious yeah. teams. There, there had to be some significant moments of, what do I want to say, the fisticuffs, brawls. Confrontation. And, 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 yeah, Co confrontation. confrontation. That's the word I'm looking for. Well, I'll tell you, Johnstown were the big bullies. And we, we had Ray Schultz, uh, Dave's brother, who was tougher than Dave, by the way, the late Ray Schultz. Uh, he invited me to get a two-bedroom apartment up in Ardmore in PA. And he and I became best of friends. Country Ray Schultz used to play country music. They're from a small town in Saskatchewan, Ray and Dave, right? And the country, Ray, we had so much fun. He was a cook. I was a cook. He had a great sense of humor, uh, a, a fearless guy who taught his brother how to fight. He used to fight his brother's battles. He was older than Dave. I loved Ray. Uh, and he died of cancer in the 90s. Another, like, between Gary Deneen and Ray Schultz. And all these great, great hockey players, guys, friends, uh, soldiers, you know, hockey warriors. And um, we had a bunch of other tough guys. Mark Buscat and uh, we had a bunch of other tough guys, man. We went through to them. But because I was a scorer, there was a guy in defense by the name of Dave Hansen. And they became the Hansen brothers of Carlson's. But Dave Hansen was bigger than me. He's like 6'2", 210 or 225. I mean, he used to run the hell out of me. And then he challenged me. I, I fought him every time. I fought him. We trade him every time. Every time he wanted to fight, I dropped my gloves and fought him. Wow. He'd hit me, I'd hit him. He'd hit me, I'd hit him. He hit me, I hit him, and then we go to the penalty box. And the next game, we'd do the same thing. He was waiting for me to quit. or, But I, I was, I'm not going to quit on anybody. Mm -hmm. So I would say, and you'd have to ask Dave, because we're, we're good friends now, believe it or not. I've seen him a number of times since then. He has a respect of me. Because I fought back, he was bigger than me, but but I, I fought my own and I held my own. And now we're, Dave and I are really good friends. And he he emailed me about a year ago and he said, Mike, I live in Pittsburgh. You ever come through Pittsburgh? Email me, you know. You can stay at my place or take out and have some beers. And there's a lot of hockey guys in Pittsburgh. And I said, Gee, Dave, that's great. But boy, I'll tell you what, if you're going to fight Dave Hanson, you better bring as as uh, as as Johnny Rose, they better bring a sandwich because you're going to be here for a while. <laughs> and boy, was he! But he, but great guy. He didn't do anything dirty. He just was straight up. Let's go. And I mean, 
I, I just I I don't I don't back away. I didn't back away from anybody. I, I didn't go looking for it. I was a hockey player, but sometimes you have to, mm-hmm. and sometimes you you get more than you bargain for, and sometimes you you know get a black eye and and uh, kind of a sore chin and 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 you have to take it because that's the way it is. Mm-hmm. I was curious, and it's obviously you gain a lot of respect among your teammates and opponents. That seems to be in, in a, one of those moments of truth for a hockey player, especially in that era, where you're going to have to stick up yourself. You're not going to have Sony protect you. You're going to have to stick up yourself. And I, I suppose not everybody has the uh, stomach for it, so to speak. It does take a lot of gumption when you're fighting Battleship Bob Kelly and Dave Killer Hansen, uh, there's a possibility of getting a black eye or a broken nose. And yeah. was there? Did you ever? Did you have fear? I when it, when it came down to the fighting part of it, before a game, you're going to play Johnstown, and you kind of know what what's waiting for you. Did you have fear going into it? Do you know something? I'm just writing a book, and it's my first novel. I've written another book, and we'll talk about that shortly. But I've written a book about an ex-hockey player who was a tough guy. And I call him Tyler Brody. I made his name up. Mm-hmm. And he played uh, in National Hockey League. And, and he fought. And he, he's, he started taking drugs and alcohol to alleviate the pain, like a lot of them did in the 90s. I, I'm putting him as a 90s guy. Um, fictitious mm-hmm. based on a culmination of a number of players and 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 so on my uh, I have a tweet uh, account and I have a chapter I've written 30 chapters I'm three quarters of the way through it and I and I put each day for the past seven days I put on my tweet account which is Michael Bowen 14 I put like a little clip out of each chapter. And one was on fear. And, and, and I quoted Brody, Tyler Brody, as simply saying that you don't fear the fight. You fear the loss. Because the loss is humiliating. It could be. But the fight is just a bunch of bruises. Mm-hmm. I mean, we can get in fights all the time in bars or streets or, or baseball games, or I can drop my bat and challenge the mound and run out the pitcher because he beamed me off my helmet or whatever. And, and it's nothing. I'm not going to hurt myself, and there's a good chance I'm not going to hurt the person. But if it looked like I lost, and everybody, all the fans in the stands will go, loser, you're a loser. Mm-hmm. That's what you, that's what you fear. I didn't fear the smacks. <laughs> I just didn't. Mm-hmm. I mean, and in you know some, here's the deal. Here's the deal. As a University of Toronto scholar, everybody thought, huh, you're not going to fight. Right. Yeah. You don't know my brother. <laughs> my my brother was the head of the plumbers and steam fitters union of Ottawa. He'd kill me if I didn't fight. <laughs> He'd beat the shit out of me. And so, so I uh, I my uh, my may have I may have been a bit of a student, but but I was a, I didn't search for the fights, but I was back backed up from nobody. Right. Very. That's very oh, true. That's uh, yeah, very. My teammates would say that. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I talk with, about that with with a few guys. Uh, it, you know, you're very young age, as you said, and you know you're out there. It's a it's kind of a spectacle. Everybody's watching. You know, if you do lose, and your team may yep. lose a little momentum, you don't want to. Like, yep. They all have the same basic approach you did, which is the the fight itself is not the issue. It's the the, the fear of oh. letting your team down and, and, and et cetera. Uh, I was curious, Mike. You're you're traded, I'm assuming, from the Philadelphia Firebirds up here to New England to the Cape Codders. 
which at the time I yeah. believe the rink was owned by the McMahon family up here. And uh, I was curious well, about your recollections of playing uh, in North American Hockey League. You're very productive, 36 points, 35 games with the Cape Codders. Uh, yes. Well, um, I get to, to call a spade a spade, and if Greg Pilling is listening, the next year, I mean, I guess I was 20, what was it, 25, going on 26 or something like that. I, I became dispirited. So, um, and Goody Brooks came to the Firebirds, which was a natural fit for Bob Colliard to play on his right side. Mm -hmm. So I was expendable, and he could get a defenseman, a hard-nosed guy, which he wanted, Mike Panath. So I was treated even up. Uh, so I go to Cape Cod, and that was the best thing that happened to me. And I'll tell you why. Because... I became friends with a guy from South Boston. Although I played against him in World Hockey Association, but now I'm playing with him and on the same line, Johnny Cunniff. Wow. And he was, he was John Cunniff from South Boston, was one of the greatest guys, one of my best pals I'd met ever. He was just terrific. And they got in trouble, that team, financially. Hartford pulled all their players out. And Johnny said, uh, there's an offer from, from Syracuse Blazers that you can go and play for them. And I said, John, I'm at the end of this, dude. I'm, I'm with you. I'm sticking with you. Mm -hmm. I'm not going anywhere. He said, well, you may not get your paychecks for a couple of weeks. I said, I don't care. I'll just play with you. And so I stuck with Johnny. And then finally they pulled the pin in February of 76. And then Johnny said, there's an open offer to go to Syracuse now if you want to. And I said, nope, I've had enough. I'm, I've talked to Carl Brewer on the phone. There's a deal in Europe for me. I'm going to go and I'm going to Greece. Because I used to go to Greece after every hockey season. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> I was a, a student of the world, shall we say. Um, and so I go to Kikladis in the islands of Kikladis and in the Oso. It was Homer's Island. And I got in touch with uh, Alpo Shunan through Carl. And Alpo was a coach in the province of England. They played in, a, uh, in, in the SM Liga, which is the Swedish Major League. Mm -hmm. And he said, we'll hire you. We'll play you. You come on up to Finland. And I did. And I got up to Finland and he got me a hockey, to Alpo Shunan to this day, I mean, he ended up coaching Chicago Blackhawks, assistant coach of uh, Winnipeg Jets, the Finnish national coach, the head of the Ice Hockey Federation of Austria. I mean, brilliant. And one of my best friends to this day. To this day. He is, uh, he is, uh, so he, he, he was only a year older than me. And I got there and I played for Alpo and, became great friends. I was the third non Finn to play hockey in the SM League and the Finnish Major League. Now, in 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 December they ran out of money and Helsing IFK, most famous team in Finland, said, Do you want to come and play for IFK? And I went to Sialpo and I said, You guys are out of money. Why don't I go with uh IFK Helsinki. He said, no problem. So I went down and I played for Helsinki IFK. And I had a great time in Finland. Luistele umpare, convielen vaetusunta, which means skate around the wing, rinking when I blow the whistle. 
change directions. You don't forget that stuff. <laughs> and so when I was in Greece, to make a long story very short, I was in Greece and I met an Australian journalist, former SAS combat guy in Vietnam in 72. So I met him in 76. He wrote me a letter in Finland when I was living in Helsinki. He said, I've met a nice rink owner. There's a four-team league in Melbourne, Australia. They don't pay anything, but they'll pay their way from Finland to Australia and Australia back to Canada if you come and play and coach. We play one game a week. So I jumped on a plane, flew to Australia, and played in Melbourne for a bunch of ragamuffins, most of them Canadians, against a bunch of Canadians and a bunch of Americans that had made their way to Australia in 70, 76, 77, so I'm there, 77. Mm -hmm. And I needed to get a job. And my friend was a producer with the biggest television station in Australia. And he said, there's an opening in the news department and you can become a film cameraman. Now, I didn't know <laughs> one end of a camera from another. I thought ASA meant a salicylic acid for, for headaches. <laughs> I didn't know that was how you rated the film of uh, the speed of the film to light. Mm -hmm. But it didn't take me long. And I've been doing it for 42 years. Directing, shooting, writing, and um, producing. And I've won an Emmy, a bunch of Geminis, a bunch of photography awards. I've been all around the world a hundred times. Oh, my God. I filmed in Africa 17 times, South America six times, China twice for two months, Russia eight times. I mean, it goes on and on and on. I mean, there's not many places that I haven't been. And I've written a book on it. It took me 12 years to write this book. And it's an e-book. And it's an e-book because there's 163 pictures and 10 maps. And it's all over the world, from Greenland to Indonesia, Brazil, to Wadabi nomads of northern Niger, and a whole bunch of other places places. For those of you who have got a pen, grab your pen and your piece of paper or text Mark <laughs> uh, at uh, his uh, website. It's called Through the Lens of My Eye Through the Lens of My Eye Full Colon Adventures of a Documentary Cameraman. And what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll put that link to the book in the show notes, and we'll obviously we'll have it on our yeah, on our, uh, sure. our social media as well. It, it yeah. Just and you know, my you know, I, I had a couple more quick questions for you. Number one, the so you end up having this incredible career, creative, but it's also a career that requires a lot of discipline, sometimes a lot of physical discipline. Uh, just you know, yeah. you know, back in the seventies, with a professional grade camera, not an easy. It's a very physical uh, act to do that consistently and to do it well. So what type of discipline transfer was there for being a professional athlete to being a, a cinematographer, <laughs> if any? Have you, have you been talking to Tracy Wilson? No, I have not. Okay. I'm going to tell you this one very famous story, and it's true. And you can ask Peter Demers. The, the Hall of Fame trainer with the Los Angeles Kings. Mm -hmm. There was a trainer with, with the Springfield Kings. And it was when I first came down to Springfield and Johnny signed me. And the practice at Springfield was traditionally during the week at 9.00. Now that meant 9.00.00.00. .00. <laughs> there was a giant 
giant clock in the Springfield Arena, which is at the Eastern States Coliseum. Huge clock, biggest clock I've ever seen, biggest Big Ben. And when it got time to round two minutes to nine, or one minute to nine, Peter Demers would stand at the gate at the player's bench with the door open, and Johnny Wilson would stand at the center ice with his whistle and watch the second hand go down to 20, 19, 18, 17, until it hit zero, zero. Peter closed the door. Johnny blew the whistle. Practice started. You weren't there. You didn't practice. You sat on the bench. You watched the team practice. You came in at the end of the practice. You apologized to your teammates. And you threw $100 in the party fund. You were never late for practice. And that was the discipline that Johnny threw at you. Now, fast forward. When I run film crews, we go out. And they go, okay, Mike, what time do you want to start? And I'll go, well, sunset's at... 626 and we need first light so that's at 558 so let's meet the lobby at 543 and then we'll make our way down so we catch first light (laughs) and they look at me like you're off your rocker and I used to say you never met Iron Man Johnny Wilson (laughs) (laughs) that's true That's, that's true story they think I was crazy, but I'll tell you what. I I had to threaten them. I'd say, we have a party fund because all those guys like to drink beer. So you gotta put a you gotta put a hundred bucks in that pot, and we're gonna drink it if you're late. And if you're five minutes late, we're not even waiting for you. We're gone. Mm-hmm. You have to make yourself. You have to make yourself. You, you have to make your way to the to wherever we're shooting. Best of luck. Right. I well. never. <laughs> I was. I was a kind of an Iron Man Johnny Wilson crew director <laughs> All right. well, GOP. His influence obviously yeah. extends to, to your life, and I'm glad I called you on time, by the way. I had one quick question, uh, Mike, too, sure. about your career. I could cherry pick a zillion stories, and I'll, I'll be reading your book, but uh, the one I was curious about, just because I was just trying to put myself in that position, you're in Rwanda, and yeah. I, I believe it's Silverback Gorillas as part of the, the documentary, yep. but you came, I don't want to say face-to-face, yep. but you had an encounter. Face-to-face. And what was that like? Tell me about that experience. Well, that was a very, very successful film. It was my idea to do that film, and the film was called Gorilla Doctors. And although the head of Gorilla Doctors was from Peterborough, Ontario, he was the head of uh, the Baltimore Zoo, Mike Cranfield. And I wanted to focus on Mike Cranfield as the head of Gorilla Doctors. Mm-hmm. So we went to the DR Congo, the eastern side, very dangerous side, outside of Goma, go up to Rumangabo, up about an hour and a half north of Goma, which is the other side of the volcanoes, because that's the Gorilla Massive, which is a volcano area. Or, but they're dormant, but there's five volcanoes in a row just between Rwanda and the Gia Congo. That's mm-hmm. where the gorillas are. The mountains, they do, the gorillas in the mist, the, the Diane Fossey gorillas, the one that uh, Sigourney Weaver played in, in the movie. Right. And I spent, I don't know, five months going up to eight and a half, nine, nine and a half thousand feet filming silverback gorillas and the mountain gorillas of Rwanda and the Gia Congo. And, we weren't any farther than 15, 20 feet from them, including the silverbacks. But we had trackers and, and, uh, and, and, and rangers and, and the gorilla doctors. And I'm looking through the eye of a camera. The silverback was, wasn't, he didn't, he, he didn't know me from a hole in the head and wasn't interested in me. He was more interested in the trackers because he knew that the trackers policed the area and he also knew that the vets fired darts to, and the, 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 the silverback, like he thinks you're hurting him with a dart, but in fact it's full of medicine. So he wasn't interested in me or, 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 or any of the gorillas they were interested in, in those people. So I had a, had a great time filming. 
but some of them look like some of those gorillas look like like um, Dave Hanson and Battleship Bob <laughs> Kelly. <laughs> right, well, one set of gorillas to the <laughs> next, and like I said, there you go. We, we traded in uh, the. the uh, <laughs> The hockey stick for yeah. the for the camera, and it was tremendously interesting to talk to you, Mike. I really appreciate it. Went a little bit over yeah, time. Yeah, no problem. And uh, Mark, just one thing I want to say is mm-hmm. thank you very, very much for inviting me on. Thank you to all of your listeners. Uh, it's so much fun to tell these stories, and I hope they had fun listening to them uh, because I enjoy telling them. And finally. We'll see you at Springfield Hockey Heritage uh, weekend. I'm so looking forward to it. I'm glad you're coming, and we'll have a beer together. We sure will, Mike. I greatly appreciate it, and we all greatly appreciate the time you spent with us today. Very, It was just fascinating. I knew it would be. Thanks so much, and we look forward to seeing you this weekend. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Mike. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thanks again for listening to the Pro Hockey Alumni Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Remember, you can reach us by our website. If you want to email us, just hit the contact form there. Also, we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you have any comments about this show or previous shows or any suggestions for future shows, just let us know. Look forward to seeing you next time on the Pro Hockey Alumni Podcast.